Hello, students. Professor Sinek here. I'm twiddling my thumbs for a bit. I've got a new concoction waiting on the Bunsen burner. It's almost done, and if you're watching this, I imagine you might have some interest in it. But until then, I have a review of We Happy Few for your entertainment. So controllers down, pencils up, classes in session. If you want to avoid minor narrative spoilers, skip ahead to this part in the video. We Happy Few takes place in post-World War II England in the city of Wellington Wells, but it's a wee bit different from our reality because in this timeline, the Americans decided against entering World War II. Subsequently, England fell to the Germans. The game alludes to the citizens of Wellington Wells committing an atrocity at the compulsion of the Germans. The awfulness of this act, the specifics of which are unknown to the player, hang heavy on the hearts of the Wellies. They need a way to cope with the terrible things they did, which in turn leads to their brilliant solution, a medication called joy. Joy imparts upon its subject a sense of euphoria. The world looks brighter, cares are thrown by the wayside, a wide smile is involuntarily plastered across their faces. They begin to realize that, nah, maybe life ain't so bad after all. But users will find that, with long term use, their memory starts to lose its integrity. Which is perfect if you're trying to forego ownership of your shitty actions and instead want to forget it all. And with the creation of joy, wellies begin taking it by the bucketful to toast their memories and feel happy for the first time in a long while. Eventually, Joy consumption becomes mandatory, and not only is joy distributed freely to the inhabitants of Wellington Wells, it's added to the water supply. Those who go off of their joy face severe consequences, and these individuals are referred to as downers. And there you have the foundation of We Happy Few's narrative. You get to play as three characters through the course of the game, all of whom are downers. Arthur Hastings plays the part of Everyman, who works as an editor at the Archives Department, scrubbing away negative points in Wellington Wells' history. Sally Boyle, who's a top-notch chemist, has her own business and is a fashionista, and Ollie Starkey, a raving mad veteran of the war. What I enjoyed most about the gang of protagonists is that they are so exquisitely flawed. Now look, I know that most games try to give their protagonists a few flaws to make them feel more human and believable, but if it's not done convincingly, it's akin to that dickhead in a job interview that says one of their weaknesses is that they work too hard. But no, We Happy Few excels at making the protagonists' flaws a vital part of their developmental foundation while still making them likable. Arthur is an intelligent man, but he has a palpable dickishness to his attitude. Sally is a girl who knows she's got it going on and uses this to her advantage, much to the chagrin of those around her. And Ollie is just annoyingly psychotic. And don't forget, something terrible did occur in Wellington Wells, and the three of them are wellies, so... well, you get what I'm saying. It's possible that more... unlikable traits will be revealed about them as you progress through the game. But there was just something so... human about their flaws, and maybe that's why, despite these flaws, I still found myself glued to their narrative and felt sorrow as our journey together ended. I'm not usually a fan of playing multiple protagonists, because I feel like the characters get deluded because the developers now have to dedicate time to building a well-rounded narrative for several characters instead of one. But this is a rare instance where I found every character's development well executed. The hook for each of our leads is that they're all downers, so they're not regularly taking joy. They each have a different reason for not taking joy, but suffice to say, being a downer is not going to fly in Wellington Wells, so each of them are trying to escape the city. But the narrative reason of escape the dystopian city isn't all that's there, no, each character's motivation for wanting to leave is different, and these motivations are juicy and meaty, perfect for a gamer like me who appreciates fine narrative. The protagonist's stories are enhanced further by golden masks you'll find scattered throughout Wellington Wells. Picking one up plays a short audio clip of your current character's life before the terrible events that led up to Wellington Wells' current situation. The players who value narrative will do well to perform a bit of extra exploring to find these masks as they help to fill in some of the gaps in your character's stories. And I don't want to spoil too much, but I'll say that the resolution of each tale is pretty rewarding, and sometimes downright Shyamalanian. Is that a word? Shyamalanian? I can't be the first person to say that. Feeling parched after a long hard day? Why not try a Shyamalanian spritzer? 
made with water sourced from somewhere in this region of the world. Probably, Shamalanian spritzers are cool, refreshing, and finish with a surprise citrus twist. In addition to our classic flavor, Shamalanian spritzers are available in grape and raspberry. But it really doesn't matter what flavor you try, they pretty much taste the same anyway. Try a Shamalanian spritzer today, the only drink that'll be sure to have you in the kitty squealing. I was not expecting that. Available now at your local Wawa. But the endings were overall very fulfilling. They made me sit back in my seat and reflect on the tale that unfolded before me. If I have a critique on any of the endings, it would be Sally's. Just because it felt like it stayed a little too much on the straight and narrow, it just didn't catch me off guard like Arthur and Ollie's endings did. But that complaint aside, I did enjoy each character's overall narrative. The protagonists do not exist in a vacuum. The world of Wellington Wells has a very distinct vibe to it that assists in the narrative process. The back of the case for the game describes Wellington Wells as a retro-futuristic 1960s England, and I think that We Happy Few stays true to this description. You'll see the buildings have tubing filled with a purple-colored substance called Mullentine, which is the fuel of the future. While a few steps away, you can step into a room that emanates flower power. Street police, otherwise referred to as bobbies roam the street with their billy clubs and whistles, whilst manning checkpoints that contain machines that can detect if you've taken your joy. And speaking of joy, the overarching atmosphere does feel positively Orwellian. Or perhaps Huxleyan, I don't know, I don't have time for this debate. Whichever side you fall on, I think it can be agreed that We Happy Few does dystopia right. The game makes you believe the situation is so dire. It is so helpless that really your only option is to pop a joy and forget about the state of things. And I do appreciate We Happy Few's humor. It is decidedly English in its attempts to elicit laughter, which I am a major fan of because I don't like my humor to beat me into a bloody pulp just to get a chuckle. And while we're on the subject of English humor, I'm saying this without any reservations, the British office is far superior to the American office. Come at me, bro. And so it goes to all of those who didn't choose to close your browser after that comment. We Happy Few deserves to be commended on its narrative performance. It not only has a strong protagonist, it has three of them. And those characters have been put into a fascinating, peculiar dystopia. Is the narrative perfect? No, certainly not. The characters that extend beyond the protagonist tend to be pretty one-dimensional, and each protagonist story has its weak points. But all in all, the narrative was enough to keep my ears bent. We Happy Few's narrative receives a B- Plus. We Happy Few is a first-person survival adventure game, but unlike most survival games I've played, it leans heavily into the narrative elements. Strong narrative and survival elements can be a difficult pairing, to be frank, and it comes down to the nature of how survival games are traditionally structured. It's difficult to shoehorn cogent narrative into a genre that focuses heavily on exploration, resource gathering, and meter watching, because, let's be honest, who the f has time to take part in a good story when you're constantly dying of dysentery? But we happy few decided to forge ahead anyway with a non-traditional pairing of strong narrative and survival. This decision is likely due to we happy few's confusing history, which, without getting into agonizing detail, can be summarized as such. We Happy Few started out as a smaller project looking for Kickstarter funding. The original intent of the game was to be a roguelite survival in a procedurally generated world that could be completed in a 3-4 hour time span with a sprinkling of narrative. Compulsion found through game testing that players were more interested in the narrative aspects of We Happy Few than the survival elements. One thing led to another, Gearbox became involved which allowed for more funding, and soon the game was refocused to be a full-blown AAA title, heavily focused on the narrative while containing survival elements. Now, I'm all for untraditional pairings, but did Compulsion create a happy marriage between narrative-driven adventure and survival? Let's just say I'd ring up the lawyers and tip back a few stiff ones because the divorce is going to be a rough one. Let's start with the most obvious of survival elements in We Happy Few, your meters. Now admittedly, even in games that focus mostly on survival, I'm not the biggest fan of meters. If I wanted to worry about making sure my character wasn't hungry or thirsty, I'd stop playing a f***ing video game and live my real life because I'm always f***ing hungry and thirsty. I don't need to ruin a perfectly good hobby by trying to make it emulate real life. But I digress, there is of course hunger and thirst in We Happy Few. And from the get-go, the game puts that annoying little reminder at the top of the screen that you need to find some stuff to nosh on and gulp down. But unlike many survival games, hunger and thirst don't damage your character in any way other than affecting how much stamina you have and how quickly it drains. 
Now don't get me wrong, it still blows to have your stamina f***ed with because it means you might not be able to escape from a group of NPCs or you won't have the drive to win in a fight, but you don't really need to address hunger and thirst if you don't want to. But f*** it gets annoying seeing those little things up there. So inevitably, as I'm going throughout the world of Wellington Wells, I'm digging in every corner for food and dicking around pumping water at every well I find. But when you first start, nearly all the food you find is rotten. And because you have no other choice, you eat the rotten food. And now you have food poisoning, so now you need to find a remedy for the food poisoning. Good f***, you see the fun path this is going down already, don't you? The other basic need your character has is sleep, which reduces fatigue. Similarly to hunger and thirst, fatigue has implications on your stamina. I wish I could have slept through the survival elements of the game, but alas, I have a game to review. Now you know that I don't like having to monitor these meters like the snotty newborn children that they are, but monitor them, I did. What I found interesting about them is the fact that they really don't matter all that much in the long run. It's as if Compulsion knew that people were going to hate these things, so they dampened their impact by essentially making it optional to even address them. I don't like having to monitor these. However, I do believe that if you have a vision for your game, you need to stick to it. The survival meters in We Happy Few just feel like an abandonment of vision. Why doesn't hunger affect me more? Why doesn't thirst cripple me? Because there is no real reason for me to address these needs for my character, I don't until the sight of these things piss me off. Simply put, it just feels like they didn't fully commit out of fear that assholes like me would have words to say about it. And I would have, but stick to your guns! We Happy Few, of course, needs to have its own unique spin on meter watching, and that is by having to watch your consumption of joy. Now, why take joy? Well, there are certain areas of the game where there will be joy detectors. If you waltz through them without being on joy, you'll alert the bobbies and the situation will be absolute bedlam. So you pop a joy to fit in, make your way through, easy peasy, lemon squeezy. But it ain't so simple, because of course it f***ing isn't. When you take joy, it only lasts for a certain amount of time. Once that time expires, you now have a joy hangover. If wellies see you when you're having a joy hangover, they freak the f*** out and begin chasing you down. If you take too much joy, you have a joy overdose. Again, people will freak the f*** out and chase you down. And if you take too much joy over the long term, you have joy-related memory loss, and again, people freak the f*** out. And to an extent, I get it. This ties into the narrative. This joy stuff is nasty, and by taking it in-game, you realize how nasty it is. But we're also playing a video game here. Aren't we supposed to be having some fun? Between Joy literally f***ing up everything you try to do in this game, combined with the other meters you have to babysit makes me feel less like I'm playing a video game and more like I'm living my normal, insignificant life. And then there's the bugs. Holy shit, the bugs and glitches in this game. There's so many bugs in this game that at first glance I mistook it for Oogie Boogie. And, well, why don't I just show you? So yes, I understand that most of what I showed you are not bugs that affect your ability to play the game, but that's the thing, there's plenty of issues with We Happy Few that did have a negative impact on my game playing experience. Now I'll start off by saying that I was pretty fortunate that I didn't have any issues while playing that corrupted any of my save files. However, there are plenty of reports out there of the game doing just that. I'll pour out a beaker for those poor souls who put dozens of hours into this game to be rewarded with corrupted save files. But as for the issues I experience, the one that stands out at the forefront that made the game nearly unplayable at certain points were the load screens. And you might be thinking, oh professor, you're just spoiled. Remember when games took a long time to boot up and that was the standard? Yes, as a matter of fact, I do recall a period of gaming when long load times were the norm. But we are beyond that. Games have optimized their performance. I shouldn't have to wait for several minutes for the game to decide I can start playing, especially when this is a premium priced title. And it wasn't really even the initial boot screen that upset me. Was it long? Sure, but I'm willing to be a little more lenient when you're firing up your save file. I mean, the world of Wellington Wells is pretty large. But what is unacceptable is when the load screen pops up seemingly for no reason. Yes, while playing We Happy Few, 
you'll be treated to load screens that seem to pop up whenever the moment strikes them. And I thought to myself, maybe I'm just imagining this. Are the load screens happening because I'm going to a different area? Was something about to happen that the game needed some additional time to load? After paying closer attention, I came to the following two conclusions. Number one, load screens seemed to happen with machine gun succession whenever I was running, especially when a big group of NPCs were following me. And number two, load screens occurred pretty much whenever the f they felt like it. So more or less, I think that these load screens are related to poor performance of We Happy Few. I don't know if this is because I was playing on the PS4 as opposed to being a member of the Master Race, but come on, if the game can't run on the PS4 without ejaculating a load screen on me every few steps, then the f***ing game shouldn't be on the PS4. Period. And the game crashed on me four times to be specific, and look. Things like this happen, I totally understand that crashes can happen, things get missed, sometimes something isn't optimized, whatever. But when it happens to me four times while playing through a game, this is now habitual, we have a pattern going on here. And I came out clean on the other side, and didn't lose much progress as a result of these crashes, but I have to imagine that crashes in We Happy Few probably f***ed up some people's good times royally. I mean, if they were having fun, I'm beginning to believe the only people who would like this game are sadomasochists. I'm gonna be frank here, if not for the fact that I was reviewing this game, I absolutely would have quit playing it in the first of the three chapters because the performance of the game is so piss poor. There really isn't a single excuse I would accept at this point for how god awfully bad this game's performance is. It was from an indie studio. Yeah, but they had the backing of Gearbox and dressed this game up and sold it as a premium title. Maybe they were under a time crunch to get this game out now that Gearbox was involved. Well, maybe, but why is that my problem? Then they needed to push back the release of this smelly turd to polish it up a bit. Who cares? The game focuses mostly on narrative elements anyway. Again, true, but would you put up with your brand new Blu-ray of Deliverance skipping every 15 seconds? No, you'd be f***ing livid. He got a little pretty mouth thingy, thingy, thingy. <sighs> okay. Let's set aside the performance issues and continue to look at what We Happy Few has to offer for gameplay. The skill specking is something that stood out to me. Each character has their own skill tree. Something unfortunate that you find out is that you play each character's story one at a time. So you play Arthur, and once his story commences, you play the next character. Once you're done with a the character, their entire skill tree and inventory go with them. This makes skill specking feel less important to me. Why should I invest all of this time into upgrading my character when that character is going to be yanked out from under me in a short time? You need to make the players feel invested in their character to help build that engagement in activities like specking. Anyway, it does behoove you to do it regardless of the fact that it won't matter in a short while, because it makes the game much more bearable as you add skills. Each character has a set of passive skills, for instance, Arthur can run fast, Sally has a wider ability to craft chemicals, Ollie has diabetes, oh, whoa, wait, what? He has diabetes? Like I'm going to have another meter to f*** with now because his blood sugar's out of whack? Diabetes. But anyway, each character has their own set of passive abilities and traits. Some are good, some not so good. Diabetes. And then each of them have three different trees. Some of the skills are shared between the three characters, but then there are some unique ones as well. For instance, Ollie, despite his affliction, has the ability to improve his fighting skills above and beyond what Arthur and Sally are able to. What I found really interesting about the skill tree is that a large portion of the skills seem to be there as a way to subvert the design of the game. Let me give you a few examples. The OU skill. Staring, jumping, crouching, and running no longer annoy people. Yeah, fun tidbit, while you're playing in Wellington Wells, if you do any of these things without this skill, it will, as the skill says, annoy people. And by annoy, they'll chase after you with the f***ing bats and nightsticks and kill you. So have fun walking everywhere without this one. The nothing to see here skill. Curfew no longer applies to the player. So if you're out after 9 p.m., the bobbies will chase you down in mass if they see you. So you need to do nearly everything during the day unless you have this skill. The tireless skill. Oh, this is my favorite. With this one, you no longer experience the negative effects of thirst, hunger, and fatigue. And it doesn't work. Yep, the fucking thing doesn't work. One of the most expensive skills in the game doesn't fucking work. I looked at the skill tree in its entirety before allocating points to see what skills I ultimately wanted to work towards. 
and Tireless was the ultimate goal. It was the Red Rider BB gun, the PF Flyers of We Happy Few. This is what I wanted to work towards because it would eliminate one of the most annoying and pedantic aspects of the game. And the skill, it doesn't work. After purchasing it, I was still getting hunger and still getting thirsty, still getting fatigued. I didn't know if I was doing something wrong or misinterpreting what the skill does. So after a bit of research, I found out that I was not alone. It seemed to not be working for most people. Awesome. But put aside this glitch, I find it kind of f***ed that I was working towards a skill that literally takes out aspects of the game design. It's as if the developers knew that the survival features were shit, and as a reward for sitting through them for hours on end, you'd get to forego these mechanics. Problem is, like many things in this game, it flat out doesn't work, so yeah. Oh, and one more thing on the skill trees. You get points to spend on skills when completing the missions. Thing is, you can buy nearly all of the skills just by completing the main missions. This was a major relief because it meant I didn't need to play all of the side missions to get good skills. But again, it's almost as if the developers knew you didn't want to play the side missions and consequently gave you an abundance of points during the main story missions. The developers just knew you didn't want to play this game and they keep providing convincing ways not to play it. About the most fun I had in the game was battering Welly's faces in who, rightfully so, were attacking me because I was ransacking their homes for moldy food so I could lower my hunger, get food poisoning, vomit, and then drink their joy-laced water because I was now dehydrated. Which leads me to combat. It's an unmitigated disaster. We Happy Few has no guns, so most of your combat is limited to items like cricket bats, pipes, etc. You can be a prick and throw darts at people, but it's much more fun to beat the living piss out of a welly, pick them up, and throw their lifeless body over the edge of something. I guess the best way to describe the combat is that it's really clunky and inorganic. Enemies run up to you, give you the business, sit there, have a coffee break to give you plenty of time to retaliate, then attack you once more, and that's the cycle. I pretty much never encountered an NPC that wasn't easy to beat into a bloody pulp in a matter of moments. The most difficult situations were not because of the toughness of the enemies, but rather the fact that there was a mob of them. But even then, the slowest of characters, Ollie, was easy enough to kite the NPCs and pick them off one by one. <sighs> really what it comes down to is We Happy Few is a game that doesn't know what it wants to be. It wants to have that strong narrative, which largely it accomplishes, but it also wants to be a survival game so bad, but at the same time it knows that people really don't want to f*** with the survival elements, so they end up getting watered down. And this is completely separate from the fact that the game feels and performs like it's still in beta. And I thought to myself, okay, ignore the constant loading screens, ignore the crashes, ignore all the other bugs and glitches. Taking those out of consideration, is the game fun? And the answer is a resounding no. Just no. Running around finding resources to address meters and doing errands for NPCs to advance the protagonist's story is the bulk of what you'll be doing, and it just isn't done in a satisfying way. But pairing that with the fact that the game feels so unfinished, and you have a recipe for disaster. We Happy Few's gameplay gets a grade of D-. First, let's address the audio. We Happy Few's protagonists have quite a few voice lines throughout the game. While there's many cutscenes, you'll find the characters sort of talking to themselves to explain what's going on, mostly for your benefit. I think that the voiceover casting for the protagonists were spot on. Their performances did a great job of reinforcing their individual situations. Arthur's voice is a bit timid, but loves to mutter insults under his breath. Sally's voice has a confidence to it, and Ollie just sounds like a downright mad Scott. Most of the secondary characters had good performances as well, like Uncle Jack, who is the omnipresent spokesperson for Wellington Wells. His delivery is creepily upbeat, which is exactly what you'd expect out of a person trying to keep a bunch of joy addicts cool and collected. But something I did notice is that the NPCs you encounter repeat their voice lines quite a bit. You have the ability to greet pretty much anyone you see in the game, and shortly into it I noticed that they were just saying the same things over and over again. I understand it's difficult to record a large pool of voice lines, especially with this many NPCs, but it was enough to damage some of the immersion. And the soundtrack is, well I'll say it, positively smashing. You have the basic gameplay music present while going about your business, but occasionally, 
A cutscene will treat you to a track from the band The Make Believes. I really encourage you to check out some of their tracks for the game. They have a distinct 60s feel to them. When I was going back to the tracks to listen to them for the review, I couldn't help but feel like I should be wearing bell bottoms with a joint in my hand. The upbeat feeling music that takes strong influences from that era is perfect for the situation. Everyone in We Happy Few gives the outward, springy appearance of happiness, but deep down, they are nursing a sadness. This music just makes you want to pop a joy and wash away those woes. And after a bit of research on Compulsion's website, it looks like they pulled together musicians from the area to form the make-believes for the specific purpose of creating music for the game. To me, that shows a lot of dedication to the soundtrack, and I'm amazed that they went to those lengths. It really does come through in the quality of the soundtrack. As for the visuals, We Happy Few, as mentioned earlier, builds itself as a game set in a retro-futuristic 60s England, and the visual style exudes this. When you're on Joy, the streets are a bright rainbow of colors. Everyone appears supremely jovial. Hell, even your character begins swinging their arms, bouncing with each step. But then, as you come down from the Joy, you see the world as it is. It's dark, dreary, and everyone around you is in a medically induced state of happiness, which is really creepy. So on its surface, Compulsion nailed the aesthetic they were advertising, but much like Joy users, everything appears peachy keen on the surface. But digging in a bit deeper reveals something nefarious. I found that there were a lot of instances where attention to detail was lacking. For instance, there's a lot of NPCs in We Happy Few, but they're repeated over and over and over again. Each NPC that doesn't factor into the main story just feels like a cookie cutter person. One glaring example of this is the old lady NPC. Apparently this is what every single old lady looks like in Wellington Wells. And I know this is nitpicky, but while scavenging for supplies, I noticed that the books on a shelf in in one of the laboratories was just repeats of the Brothers Grimm. I mean, how many fucking copies of the Brothers Grimm do you need? And from there on out, I found myself checking bookshelves as I went, and what do you know, it seemed every bookshelf was just a bunch of repeats of whatever book they decided to put on it. And when speaking to characters, their mouths don't seem to sync up with the audio, and their face textures are all fucked up, and it makes me feel like I'm playing a high-end PlayStation 2 game. Plenty of examples of this laziness are present throughout Wellington Wells, and we can't forget the earlier mentioned bugs, many of which manifest themselves in We Happy View's graphics. It really does a lot to destroy the immersion of this peculiar dystopia when an NPC is sitting through a fucking chair like part of him was lost in a portal or something. And with that, We Happy View's audio gets a grade of B+, and its visuals a D+. We Happy Few runs the standard AAA price of $59.99. It took me approximately 30 hours to get through the main story for each protagonist, and I really didn't do much in terms of dawdling around with extra content because, well, you heard the review, you know why I wanted to finish this game post haste. Now, purely from a standpoint of duration, I think that $60 is a fair ask for 30 hours of content, but let's be real here, you're paying for an unfinished product. This does not feel like a game with any amount of polish to it. And you're asking me for 60 smackaroonies for it? The absolute gall they have to ask premium price for a game that is essentially still in beta. And I don't want to hear the tripe about, Oh, well, all it'll take is a mega patch and everything will be great. No, I didn't pay $60 for a game's potential. People who paid the reduced rate when the game was in alpha and beta were paying for potential. Not me. I paid for a finished product. Look, let's say I waltzed into a car dealership and told them I'd like to pay for a brand new Escalade, complete with gelato server and nipple stimulators. After payment, they roll out a Boy Scout soapbox car. I'd be furious. My mouth needs refreshment, my nipples stimulation, where is my goddamn Escalade? The dealer then informs me, well, yes, we realize you paid for the Escalade, and we gladly took the money for the Escalade, but the soapbox car is what we have for you now. But look, one day we will be able to turn this soapbox car into the Escalade you paid for. The foundation is there, all we need are all of the other bits. 
We promise that one day, you'll have your Escalade. This is what's happening here. Gearbox and Compulsion thought they could just shove a game out into the void, expect people to pay full price because they thought they were getting a full product, and then fill in the pieces to make it a full experience as they have time to. Doesn't this sound strangely familiar to another game that promised a lot and failed to deliver on pretty much all of it? But now I'm expected, nearly two years later, to give a flying f about it because they said, hey, now the game is pretty much done. F that noise. If I pay $60 for a game, I expect it to be finished. And I feel like I am a fair person. Problem here and there on a premium price game, I get it. The problems will be sorted out. But the game is nearly unplayable at points, and for some people, truly was unplayable. And while I won't take this into account for the grading, but can you believe that they sold a We Happy Few time capsule pack for $150 and it doesn't even come with the c***ing game? Good God. But anyway, 30 hours of content? Good. 30 hours of mostly miserable content that is at times unplayable? Bad. And you're charging me what for it? We Happy Few receives a value grade of D. And students, there you have it, my review of We Happy Few. It really is kind of depressing playing a game that you can see buried deep down some potential, but the developers, they just weren't able to extract any of it. And the result is a game that I wish I could forget that I even played. Speaking of which, my earlier mentioned concoction is ready for consumption. See, I thought it would be nice to have a drug that can help me forget all of the shitty games I've ever played, and if I can perfect the formula of this, I'm going to make a killing in YouTube comment sections, those miserable bastards who lurk around there just complaining about games all day. Oh, it'll be great, I'll be able to keep the lab running for years. And I even made it into a spray form so it's easier to consume for those who are facially impaired. So after playing We Happy Few, I don't see a more opportune time to try this, so why don't we give it a whirl, shall we? Here we go. Do one or the other. Okay. All right, give it a second to take effect. Whoa. Oh, God. Oh, damn it. Oh, damn it. Oh. 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 Whoa. Whoa, that was an experience. Okay, I think I'm back down to earth here, huh? Oh, God. God, I still remember it all though. The, all the load screens, the, the game crashes, the general monotony of the entire game. It's all still in there. I don't I don't know what I did wrong. I, what, oh, hold on a second. This is just, this is just Afrin 24 hour decongestant spray. I must have grabbed the wrong bottle. It expired in 1970? Oh God, okay. Well, I, Students, I have to quick run to a pharmacy dumpster and rummage through and see if I can find some antibiotics before I get a nasty case of encephalitis. Oh, and we happy few. It gets a final grade of C minus. And students, as always, I remind you to stay cynical. <laughs>